Thank you, Russ. And we will conclude, as always, our time with the time of prayer. And we're going to continue to pray for the needs of the church and for our personal needs at the end of this meeting. Let's uh, open our Bibles now to Matthew chapter 6. Tonight is our sixth message in the sermon series, Developing a Thankful Heart. God commands his children in 1 Thessalonians 5:18, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So God's will in every circumstance is that we thank and praise him. And the main reason why the Bible repeatedly tells us to thank God is because he deserves it. Uh, everything that we are and everything that we have comes from him. And thanking God glorifies and magnifies him, but it is also beneficial to us. Now, God's command to always give thanks helps us to become unselfish and confident and encouraged when we are doing this. So the command to always give thanks is God's way of bringing fulfillment to our life. Although gratitude is always beneficial, it is not always easy. And Jesus knows this, and, and that's why he gives his followers the specific lessons in this passage that we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer is given to us to be a pattern for our attitudes and our thoughts. And here in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus provides principles that should motivate us to be thankful in all circumstances. And so far, we, we observe five principles, and tonight we're going to examine the sixth principle that is found in verse 13. So look at Matthew 6, 13. Jesus tells his disciples to pray, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The underlying principle in this petition is this. God will provide the necessary guidance to lead us to victory when Satan tempts us. God will provide the necessary guidance to lead us to victory when Satan tempts us. Tempt us. And this, this petition basically is, is given to us to emphasize that God wants his people to be spared from the misery of unnecessary pitfalls. And this is the essential reason for this petition. Now, the, the Apostle Paul, you remember when he talks in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 about temptation, he develops this same idea with two illustrations in, in the first letter to Corinthians. So please turn in your Bibles for a moment to 1 Corinthians 10. And let's just see the whole chapter. It talks about temptation and, and this same idea that is developed here in Matthew 6. First of all, in, in chapter 9, in chapter 9, Paul uses himself as an example of a mature Christian who disciplined himself to better serve God. And then he moves in chapter 10 and uses the people of Israel as an example of spiritual immaturity as shown by their lack of self-discipline. And in verses 1 through 4, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verses 1 through 4, Paul talks about God's care for the people of Israel during the time of their exile from Egypt. And in the first four verses, he basically emphasizes that God blessed the people of Israel in four specific ways. First of all, he said God gave them Moses to lead them out of the slavery, and to be their spiritual leader. Then second, he said God opened up a dry path through the Red Sea so that people of Israel could escape uh, the wrath from, uh, from the Egyptian army. Thirdly, he said that God miraculously provided food and water as they traveled through the wilderness. And then fourth, he says that God gave the Israelites a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire to so they will know day and night that he will be with them every step of their journey to the promised land. So he highlights these four specific examples how God demonstrated his desire to, to satisfy his children emotionally, physically, and spiritually. He said, God gave you Moses to lead you out of the slavery to be a spiritual leader. God opened up a dry path through the Red Sea so you can escape the wrath of the Egyptian army. He miraculously provided food and water as you traveled through the wilderness, and he, he also gave you a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire so that you will know day and night that God is with you every step of your journey to the promised land. But then notice what happened to the people of Israel in verse 5. Verse 5 says, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered 
over the desert. Now, what a contrast to verses 1 and 4. They were greatly blessed by God, but yet they experienced his severe discipline. Now, the total number of people leaving Egypt is estimated to have been about 2 million. 2 million people. Now, do you remember how many people from that number enter in the promised land? Two. Yeah, two, exactly. Just two. Just two. Caleb and, Caleb and Joshua, right? So you have 2 million people who left the Egypt and only two individuals from that generation entered the promised land. All the others from that generation died in the wilderness. Now, guess what? The same thing can happen to us, right? We can disqualify ourselves from God's full blessings in our lives and wander around in spiritual wilderness. And that is a scary thought. To think for a moment that you can just disqualify yourself from God's fullest blessings in your life and just wander in spiritual wilderness wilderness. But it does not need to be so. Paul says that we can learn from the Israel's mistakes and, try and, and avoid repeating the same mistake. So he says in verse 6, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts of evil things as they did. So that happened to him, but listen, this is warning to us that we should not set our hearts on the same evil things as they did. And then he lists four specific uh, uh, things on which they set their hearts, evil things that actually uh, uh, brought such a tragedy on them from God. So in verses 7 through 10, Paul lists four practices that got Israel into the trouble with God, into trouble with God. And they are all possible pitfalls for us too. First, he said the Israelites participated in idolatry when they ate and danced in the presence of the golden calf. In, in verse 7, he talks about the event that happened in Exodus chapter 32, you know, when people uh, uh, created, made a golden calf and start worshiping. Now, for us, today, maybe we, we, today we, we may not form a, a literal golden calf, but, but our idols are just as real, right? Money, fame, work, or, or pleasure can become our idols if we put too, uh, too much attention on them for our personal identity, for security and meaning in life. Because as the Bible describes, Bible, putting trust in anything other than God is idolatry. Right? If you try to, to find meaning and purpose and security in life in anything else that God, that represents an idol in your life. So they, they participated in idolatry and God judged them for that. Second thing, that Paul mentioned is that they practiced sexual immorality. In verse 8, he, he refers back to, to, the, uh, uh, to the event that happened as they were passing through the land of, Mo of Moabites. And they, while they were going through the land of Moabites, they practiced sexual immorality with Moabites' uh, women. And Paul says in, in, in verse 8 that 23,000 Israelites did, died as a result of God's judgment. Of that day, when they engage in sexual immorality with Moabites women, God judged them by killing 23,000 Israelites at one day. Now today, the notion prevails that pornography, extramarital sex, homosexuality, and whatever may happen between consenting adults uh, creates no victims. It's not a big problem, nobody is hurt if all this is happening, so why? Why should we worry? But here, Israel. Israel serves as a reminder of what can happen to us if we adopt non-biblical sexual ethics and engage in sexual immorality. God judged them for sexual immorality. In one day, 23,000 Israelites were killed. Then Paul talks about the Israelites' third failure in verse 9. And in verse 9, he, he emphasizes that some people accuse God of carrying out an evil plan instead of a good one. You know, and he refers in verse 9 to Numbers chapter 21. And in Numbers 21, uh, we have the story where the people of God, people of Israel, were questioning the goodness and plan of God. 
Numbers 21, verse 5, we read that this is what people ask God. They said, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? There is no bread or water, and we detest this worthless food. That's what they said for bread of heaven and, and meat that God was providing. There's no water. Why did you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this worthless food. And then God sends snakes. You, the, the story talks about God sends snakes to, to, uh, to bring them back on the right path. Right now, today, I mean, we do the same thing. Right? Often we go into some, we enter into some difficult situation in our life, and the question is, God, why are you doing this to me? Why is this happening to me? Now, his plans are always good for us, even though they include adversity. And we shouldn't, you know, when we, when we start accusing God that his plans are not good plans and that he is, that he is uh, uh, abusing us, we risk drifting away from, from God, going away from God, further away from him. That was their third failure. And then Paul highlights Israel's fourth failure in verse 10. And in verse 10, he says that the Israelites frequently complain against God's appointed leaders. You know, they were blaming Moses and Aaron for their troubles. And how true is that for, for us today? When we are far away from God, you know, we tend to blame those whom God uses to bring us back to the right path. We know we are far away from God, and then somebody comes, and they try to put us on the right path, and we, we just tend to blame them, to accuse them. Throughout the day, actually, the, our real problem and our real trouble. So four specific examples of the Israel's failure, Paul lists here in verses 7 through 10. They, they participated in idolatry. They practiced sexual immorality. They accused God of carrying out an evil plan instead of a good one, and they frequently complained against God's appointed leaders. So, I mean, all of that, when you put together, we can, we can summarize it like this. As soon as they left Egypt, they assigned a particular image to God to make, to make him fit their expectations, desires, and circumstances. And this led to all kind of immorality. And when true God was no longer the object of their worship, they blamed God and his servants for their problems. That's what happened. As soon as they left Egypt, they assigned a particular image to God to make him fit their expectations, desires, and circumstances, and this led to all kinds of immorality. And when true God was no longer the object of their worship, they blamed God and his servants for their problem. Now, that's the lesson from history, right? And the Apostle Paul knows every time when he uses the lesson from history, there is two possible wrong reactions from his hearers. You know, one wrong reaction is to say, well, that will never happen to us. You know, you hear some lesson from history, that will never happen to us. Or that will be a wrong reaction. The other wrong reaction will be that, that we identify so closely with the failures of others that we start feeling that failure is inevitable. We'll say, well, yeah, no, no one, this will happen to us too. This will happen to us too. So these are two, two wrong reactions that people can have when you hear lessons from history. And, and the Apostle Paul knows this. That's, how, well, that's why he addresses those two wrong reactions in verses 12 and 13. He moves to verse 12 and 13 and addresses specifically those two wrong reactions. He says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So he reminds us here in verse 12 that falling into sin can happen to anybody. Falling into sin can happen to anybody. He says, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And then in verse 13, he Reminds, he said, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So in verse 13, he reminds us that God also knows our limits better than we do. He knows our limits better than we do, and he will help us not only to survive any temptation, but to honor him through it. That's the promise that he 
gives here. So the petition, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, emphasizes that God wants his people to avoid sinful attitudes and sinful actions that could harm us. That's the emphasis. That God, wants us, God wants his people to avoid sinful actions and attitudes that could harm us. And it also reminds us that God will provide the necessary guidance to lead us to victory when Satan tempts us. This brings us, you know, to the question, what does the Bible really mean when we uh, hear that word temptation? Temptation. What does temptation mean? And it is mentioned in the Bible. And to answer that question, we, we need to understand that the Greek word for temptation has two basic meanings. The Greek word that is used in the New Testament of temptation has two basic meanings. It has positive meaning and it has negative meaning. Now, it can mean something positive or it can mean something negative. In a positive meaning, it can be, and it often is, translated by such words as trial or tests. Trial or tests. And in those cases, in those cases the word refers to a difficult circumstances in our life designed by God with the goal to produce stronger faith and trust in him. So that's the meaning of that. So it, it refers to a difficult circumstances designed by God with the goal to produce, uh, to improve, or we can even say to improve the quality of our faith and trust in him. Now, in its negative meaning, it refers to temptation in, in the usual English sense of the word, to seduce, to lure, or to solicit to do evil. No, so this one Greek word can have two very different meanings. It can mean a difficult trial, or it can mean a solicitation to do evil. Difficult trial or solicitation to do evil. And the word, this one, same word was used with those two meanings in James chapter 1. Now turn to James chapter 1 and notice how, how those two meanings were used in the book of James. James Chapter 1, verses 2, two through 4. Look at first James chapter 1, verse 2. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, the Greek word here for trials is the same word that is used in Matthew 6.13 for lead us not into temptation. And the word here in James 1 is used in a positive sense. So James here tells us that God uses trials and difficulties to produce spiritual maturity in our lives. See, that God is using trials and difficulties to produce spiritual maturity in our lives. When you face trials, you know, a testing of your faith, here, here the Greek word for trials is the same word that is used in Matthew 6, 13, for lead us not into temptation. So the word is used here in a positive, positive sense, to refer to trials and difficulties that God is using to produce spiritual maturity in our lives. And now look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And here the word that is translated tempt and tempted is the same word used in James chapter 1, verse 2, but with a negative sense. Negative sense. Here the word, word is used as, as a, a solicitation to, uh, to, do, to do evil. Solicitation to do evil, something to do evil. So we see that the same word is used in a positive sense in verse 1 and in a negative sense in verse 13. So we can conclude three things from, from this and from uh, uh, when we think about uh, temptation. First thing is this, the Christian life, in the, in the Christian life, there are tests and temptations. In the Christian life, there are tests and temptations. So in Matthew 6.13, uh, the double meaning of the Greek word translated temptation is present. 
So in the Christian life, there are tests and temptations. Now, the second truth is this. God will never entice someone into moral failure. God will never entice someone into moral failure. And James chapter 1, verse 13 says that very clearly. And when you attempt it, don't say, you know, it's by God because God can never tempt anyone to do evil. Now, God will never entice someone into moral failure. The Father will not appeal to our evil desires and he will not lead us to a place when we are forced to do evil. To do that, that will be contradiction to both, his holiness and his love. And then third truth is this, what God gives to us as a test is almost always used by Satan as a temptation. What God gives to us as a test is almost always used by Satan as a temptation. And the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness offers a clear example of this principle. Now, turn to Matthew 4.1 and notice this. Matthew 4.1 talks about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. And notice what Matthew says. Matthew 4.1, he says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Who did the leading? The Spirit, right? Who did the tempting? The devil, right? So you see, and on three different occasions, the devil tempted Jesus to turn away from, from the path of obedience to his heavenly Father, but Jesus did not sin. And God's tests show that Jesus really was the Son of God. You know, God basically said, I will give the test, and the result of the test will show that Jesus is the Son of God, right? So that's how God gives, he gives tests. I will give the test, and the test, the results of this test will show that Jesus is the Son of God. But every time, but the truth is here, when God gives to us a test, it's almost always used by Satan as temptation. Temptation. Right, so those are three truths that we can conclude. In the Christian life, there are tests and temptations. God will never entice someone into moral failure, and when God gives to us a test, it is almost always used by Satan as a temptation. Now, so what does it mean to pray a lead us not into temptation? Well, it means, the idea is basically this. Father, do not lead us into a trial that will present to us a temptation that we will not be able to resist it. That's the idea behind it. Father, do not lead us into a trial or, or, or this difficult situation, into this test that will present to us a temptation that we will not be able to resist it. So the, prep, the proper uh, uh, prayer regarding temptation is not that we will be delivered from all temptation, for facing and overcoming Evil is necessary for our spiritual growth. Every time when we overcome, when we face evil and overcome evil, it produces spiritual growth into our lives. So the prayer, proper prayer is not to be delivered from, from all temptation. The proper prayer is to ask God to deliver us from overpowering temptations, recognizing that we are prone to fail under severe testing. When severe testing comes into our lives, we are prone to fail. So we pray that God will deliver us from overpowering temptation. And this petition, so is basically a safeguard against presumption and false sense of security and self-sufficiency. Right? That's what Jesus gives us. You know, we, just like this world, this will never happen to us, or, you know, oh, yeah, this, there's nothing we can do about it. All right? So Jesus gives us this petition as a safeguard against presumption and against a false sense of security and self-sufficiency. And... The example of Peter is actually goes in hand, hand in hand with this petition. At the Last Supper, Jesus predicted that Peter will deny him. And he also predicted that Peter will not be utterly destroyed, that he will return back to faithfulness and that he will actually be the kind of guy who will encourage others who, who need encouragement in a, time, in a time of testing. So turn to Luke, and let's see this example, Luke 22. Luke 22, and look at verses 31 and 32. Luke 22. Look at verse 31 and 32. Where Jesus is speaking, and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as a wheat, 
But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Book 22, 31 and 32. So we see here Satan's temptation and God's test. We see both, Satan's temptation and God's test. Satan's aim is to destroy Peter's faith. And this remains the main goal of Satan even today. Because committed believers, they bring honor and glory to God. So Satan does not want, you know, to, to have many committed believers around. So he's attacking committed believers because committed believers brings honor and glory to God. His main aim is to destroy believers' faith. He wants to, to prevent the manifestation of the Lord's purpose in our lives. He wants to take joy and peace out of our lives. Commitment. But we see also here God's test. Notice the main focus in this test, text passage that we read is, is not on Peter's denial. Yeah, Peter's denial is there, but focus is also on his return to faithfulness and his leadership in strengthening other believers. Because Jesus says, when you come back, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus puts the focus on, on Peter's return to faithfulness and his leadership in strengthening other believers. Jesus basically says to Peter, he said, I will teach you some I will teach you something, I will teach you some lessons, and then you will be in a position to teach others. I will use this test. This is what will happen to you. I will use this as a test to teach you something, and then you will be in the position to teach others. So what did Peter learn? What did he learn? Well, some 30 years later, he writes a letter that is known as First Peter, First Epistle of Peter, and he writes down some very uh, uh, specific things. And you remember the purpose of 1 Peter. He's writing 1 Peter to encourage suffering Christians, right? He's writing to suffering Christians to encourage them and to tell them how to live victoriously in the midst of trials. So they're going through many different trials and he's writing the letter to teach them how to live victoriously in the midst of trials. And I'll turn to 1 Peter and look at chapter 5, verses 5 through 11. 1 Peter chapter 5. Verses 5 through 11. Peter says, All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, Peter is able to strengthen other believers because he learned some lessons. First of all, he learned the truth about satanic attacks. He learned that Satan's aim is to destroy our faith. So he says to the Christians in, in verse 9, stand firm in the faith. Stand firm in the faith because Satan's aim is to destroy our faith. He also learned that Satan's power and impact are limited by God. That's why he says to Christians in verse 9, resist the devil. Resist him because his power and his impact are limited. Resist him. Resist him. He's also able to strengthen fellow believers because he experienced God's work of restoration. He talks about restoration in this passage. Why do we need a restoration? Why there is a need for restoration in Christian life? Well, there is a need because we still struggle with pride. We still struggle with pride. And that's what Peter highlights in verse 6. He says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to humble. The Christian life is a life of faith demonstrated by humility. That's what Christian life is supposed to be, a life of faith demonstrated by 
humility, and pride keeps us away from that kind of life. Now, what is pride? What is pride? The Bible describes pride uh, and portrays pride as self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and insubordination to the Word of God. That's what pride is, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and insubordination to the Word of God. And Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before a fall. Now, what was the nature of Peter's failure? Think about it. Peter failed. Why did Satan attack him? He did fail. What was the nature of his failure? Why did Peter deny that he is a follower of Jesus Christ when Jesus was arrested? And the answer is pride. Pride. Now, think about it for a moment. You know, in Matthew 26, you know, they celebrate actually the Last Supper. There is the Last Supper. And Jesus said that one of his disciples, one among them, among these 12, will betray him. He said, one of you will betray me. Now, you remember what Peter said to Jesus. He said, Matthew 26, 33, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. Even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. Now, failure starts with spiritual self-confidence. You know, my pastor in Croatia often used to say, he said, beware when you start sounding too spiritual. <laughs> beware when you... Start sounding too spiritual. Peter said, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. Now, after the Last Supper, Jesus left. He took three disciples with him to the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, actually, they left to the Mountain of Olives, where he uh, often goes to pray. And, and Matthew and Mark tells us that Jesus left most of his disciples at the entrance of the Garden, and then he took only three of them. He took Peter, James, and John inside the garden for him, with him to pray. And in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told the disciples, you remember what he told them, he said, pray for strength to, avo to avoid falling in the midst of temptation. He said, come here and let's pray. And let's pray this, pray that you will have strength to avoid falling in the midst of temptation. Now, what did Peter do? <laughs> he, he, he slept instead of praying. He was sleeping because of his self-confidence. He, he did not realize how much he needed prayer, how much he needs to pray. And that's what, you know, self-reliance. Pride is self-reliance, self-confidence, and pride is also insubordin insubordination to the Word of God. You know, here in Luke, that we read in Luke 22, 31 to 34, Jesus tells Peter twice that he will deny him but Peter does not want to believe it. He did not take the word of God seriously. Now, if we are honest with ourselves, we must admit that Peter's story is our story. All right? Peter's story is our story. None of us is exempt from spiritual prayerlessness. We all, when we know we need to pray, we don't pray. We would rather sleep or do something else. None of us is exempt from spiritual prayerlessness self-confidence and insubordination to the Word of God. Now, Peter is able to strengthen fellow believers. He learned the lesson, and that's why he's strengthening all of us with his letter. He's able to strengthen fellow believers because he learned the truth about Satan's attacks. He learned the truth about pride and humility. And he also learned that spiritual warfare is a winnable war. Spiritual warfare is a winnable War. Peter says in 1 Peter 5.10, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Now there is no doubt, we know that the words of Jesus from Luke chapter 22 were in his mind when he was writing these words. You know, Jesus predicts that Peter will deny him but at the same time, he assures Peter that he will be restored. Yes, you will deny me, but you will be restored. If the father allowed Satan, he gave him the opportunity to attack Peter. But in response to Jesus' prayer, Jesus said, I'm going to pray for you, Peter. He's going to try to destroy your faith. I'm going to pray for you. And in response to Jesus' prayer, he strengthened Peter's faith. And Peter became a different man altogether after Jesus restored him. And then in the book of Acts, 
We see Peter as the one who walks in the Lord's strength and not on his own. He's not relying anymore on his own strength. He's relying on Lord's strength. And he became the rock of support to other believers. Peter, the rock. Rock of support to other believers. And, and, and the great thing is that, you know, the same thing that happened to Peter can happen to us, right? The same God that Peter served is the God that we serve today. So the petition, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, emphasizes that God wants his children to be spared from the misery of unnecessary pitfalls. God wants his people to avoid sinful actions and attitudes that could harm them. And this petition also reminds us that God will provide the necessary guidance to lead us to victory when Satan tempts us. So let's be the kind of people who are devoted to prayer, the kind of people who are applying God's principle in our lives, and the kind of people who are trusting in the Lord and allowing God to restore us, even when we fall down and put us back on the right path. Amen? Amen. God promises that, that he will provide everything that is necessary to lead us to victory when Satan tempts us. And that's something that should motivate us to be thankful in any circumstance of our life. Amen? Amen. All right, let's conclude our worship as always to break in a small groups and pray for the, uh, for the things that re regarding our church, for the needs of our church. You can focus over there, and then you can share also personal, uh, personal prayer requests if you have anything in your life that you would like uh, for the group to pray with you. And, and don't feel uncomfortable. I know that sometimes when you go in small groups, don't, don't think you need to pray. Be free to pray, but, you know, it doesn't mean you need to pray. Let the group, whoever feels led to pray, you just pray. If you just want to be there, part of the group, just be there. You don't need to pray out loud. Just let's come together to the Lord and, and put our eyes on him and just pray. All right, let's break.